All right. Um, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, those of you who are here. Um, welcome to this uh, first in what might become a, well, what we hope will become a series of, um, of webinars from us here at Intersect. Um, thanks for joining us for uh, your lunch. Um, my name is Aidan Wilson. I'm um, the e-research analyst at Australian Catholic University. And with me today is Anastasios Papioanou, who is um, Intersect's uh, data science lead. Um, and also we've got Gulam Mutaza, who's the um, e-research analyst from uh, La Trobe. Um, he'll stay in the background and he'll monitor the, uh, the Q&A and, um, and chat. So if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A and hopefully Gulam will be able to answer them. Or we might have time later to, um, to answer some questions that, that he might uh, keep, keep for us um, later. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to, um, whoops, pardon. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the countries uh, throughout Australia on which we're all uh, meeting. For me, that's the Gadigal people of the uh, Yora Nation. And for Anastasios, um, that's the Kamaragal people of the, um, of the Yora Nation, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and we extend our uh, respect to all Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders today. All right. So um, just a little bit about Intersect. Um, actually, Anastasios, maybe you could click forward here because I'm having issues doing that. Okay, just a little bit of a background about Intersect if you don't know who we are. Um, we're a not-for-profit membership-based organization that focuses on e-research. Uh, we were formed in 2008 by a consortium of New South Wales universities, and we're governed today by a consortium of that by a consortium of thirteen Australian universities, which is not just within New South Wales anymore. And we operate across five states and territories. We provide universities and their researchers with um, advice and training and support in the use of technology in research. Um, we provide lots of training and research technology tools, um, and we also develop high quality software for research use cases, amongst other things. Uh, here is a um, here is a list of our members, which are mostly in New South Wales based universities, but uh, recently we've also got some of our members are from the ACT, Victoria and South Australia. Anastasia, I'll serve you. So this is uh, the support model we use at Intersect. Um, we have e-research analysts based at uh, our member universities, and you can see here actually um, how it's working. Uh, the, the main um, uh, part here is that all the arrays are sharing um, knowledge between the universities and also like they're collaborating in order to solve e-research problems and also like provide some training. And regarding training, we provide hands-on training in e-research tools for our member universities. And to date, we have trained uh, more than 16,000 researchers and staff members uh, in uh, over 1,300 courses at 15 institutions across four states, uh, five states and territories. Also here, like it, it's worth mentioning that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we actually started doing some um, online training and uh, we had a webinar uh, hosted by ARDC about that. And in the last three months, actually like we're testing a lot and we are like actually fully operating um, and uh, delivering online training. And in the last three and a half months, we have delivered more than 110 online training courses and have trained around 1600 people. Okay, new webinar series. So this is something new uh, for us. We, uh, we're gonna talk how this idea um, was firstly uh, introduced, uh, but uh, it's something that we were discussing a lot and we were thinking that it's really good to share our knowledge on uh, all these e-research tools that we train and we're trying to help all uh, the research community um, about that. So we this is the first uh, webinar um, that we're delivering, but there are some more coming. So the next webinar is the showcase of data analysis in Python and R, uh, which uses uh, some COVID-19 data. And then we have also another three webinars coming, which is which are the survey tools in research, REDCap and Qualtrics, which are the most popular ones. 
Then we have another one from PC to cloud or high performance computing. So if you need um, more powerful systems to run your analysis, like we are introducing the pros and cons of these two um, uh, platforms. And then also thinking like a computer, the fundamentals of programming, because we're doing a lot of training and introductory training uh, in programming, but we thought that we should go one step up and teach also like a bit more fundamentals. Here is a course catalog and the webinar series. So I'm gonna just click just to show you a bit. So if you go to our website, you can see the list, uh, the course catalog and under the levels, there are all our webinars. At the moment we have the four of them, then the fifth is gonna come soon. And by keep clicking in one of them, actually like you can show like the description, the webinar topics and also the upcoming webinars in case you would like to enroll. Oops. So a um, bit of a history about this particular webinar. Um, this was first developed, not, not as a webinar, but just as a presentation that uh, Wei Si Chen, who's the e-research analyst at UTS, um, uh, did back in uh, October 20, 2018. Um, and that was quite successful then. And so we uh, ran this both as a workshop and as a presentation at ResBaz Sydney in 2019. Um, well, we got lots of good comments there as well. And then more recently in, in November of that year, um, our e-research analyst at Newcastle, Sean Grady, presented it um, as, a, as a presentation locally at Newcastle. Um, and it's, uh, so we've done it a few times. And uh, when we decided we would run a webinar series, this was the, uh, the first one that we thought that we should run because we're, uh, we've done it a few times and have refined it um, in, in that time. Uh, so full credit to Wei Si Chen for the original idea for this. Um, and, uh, and here we are today. Okay, just a bit about history of these programming languages. Maybe you heard them and they're like really recently used in uh, research, but they're not really like newly developed, except for Julia. So MATLAB was, uh, we're gonna talk a lot about history and all the pros and cons of the programming languages, but just to give you a bit of uh, idea when they were created, so MATLAB is the only, oldest one, um, and then followed by Python and R really closely. And then after almost two decades, we have Julia, which we're gonna talk about. So for topics today, we'll, um, we'll go into why would you program in the, uh, at all in the first place? Um, we fully expect there might be people here who've never programmed before. So um, that'll hopefully give a bit of an indication of why programming is, is, is used in research. Uh, we'll cover some use cases. Um, and then we'll go into the overview of each of the languages. Uh, so we'll sort of do some bit of history, some pros and some cons um, of each. And then Anastasios will demonstrate each of them in a, uh, live, um, hopefully, uh, if it works. <laughs> um, and after that, we will have a bit of a discussion about uh, each tool's popularity, um, the job opportunities and other pragmatic things that are not really inherent to the language, but might help you decide which uh, which of these languages um, you would like to choose. And finally, we'll land on some tips on, on, uh, on how to choose uh, the language that, that you might want to work with. Bit of a spoiler, we're not gonna give you an answer. So this is gonna be more arming you with the information that you might need to make that decision for yourself. So we're not gonna say MATLAB is the winner or anything. Um, it's really context dependent. And so we're helping you navigate that context. Okay, before I start um, explaining why programming, it's worth mentioning that um, uh, Aiden and I are not from a computer science background. So I'm a physicist. Um, I did a lot of programming just to solve um, complex problems that, and, um, you know, like use it for my research. And same for Aiden, uh, he was using uh, actually like programming for his research and work as well. Uh, Gulam is from a computer science, but the, the, the concept is that sometimes like we'll learn these programming uh, languages just because like it's necessary as a tool to, to perform something, to do something because otherwise it's impossible. So yeah, but it's important to note that yeah, not, neither of us, maybe Gulam separately because he did computer science, but neither of us did programming in undergraduate uni university or anything. We're sort of self-taught later because they were useful for our research. And so now we're paying it forward. And, you know, that's a large part of what Intersect does is train researchers in programming because uh, it's something that is becoming more and more 
useful as the packages extend to a whole range of disciplines. And that's a good example as well, Aidan, also to, because like that's a, a career path because we both started, like you started as a linguist, I started as a physicist, and then we ended up actually doing a lot of programming and being like major part of our role now. So yeah, this is another um, way to realize actually how um, these programming languages can be like a really, really good skill later on. So um, let's talk a bit about why programming. So the first uh, item here is about like, conducting complex set of calculations. So imagine that you have a lot of big complex problems, like you have big arrays or matrices and you want to calculate something, then it's probably impossible to, to do it by hand or like solve it. So we, we use these programming languages to help us do all these complex set of calculations. Coming from a physics background, this is my reason why I started doing programming. So to solve complex problems that sometimes is the only way because a lot of problems don't have analytical solutions. So you're trying to apply some numerical approaches or some modeling uh, to approach the solution. So for me as a physicist, like we were doing this a lot, actually like part of our studies to, to know how to approach a solution. So the only way to approach a complex problem sometimes is by doing modeling. And this is heavy calculations as well. Of course, it's a good way to speed up uh, and strengthen analysis. And by strengthen means like avoiding errors because if you do the same analysis all over again, like it's gonna take time and you need to run it again. And you may have like, you know, like if you have to run it for hundreds of different parameters, you may have some mistakes and all this stuff. So uh, using programming, you can automate and speed up the whole process. Of course, another big advantage of programming is that you can automate tasks and create pipelines. So you can connect it with different um, other um, softwares using um, API. So for example, you can connect some data that you collect from somewhere or from online, then push it to the programming language, do some analysis, do the visualization, and then automatically like create a report or something like that. So it's really, really useful um, regarding pipelines. This is actually the reason I learned uh, programming was uh, I was working in a, as, an, as an archivist in digital archive and I had to move sometimes thousands of tiny, you know, files, um, text files that contained metadata and move them into the right directories based on their file names. And it was very tedious to do manually. So uh, I learned programming so that I could automate that um, just as a micro example. So the next one is about rerunning processes with various parameters. I mentioned it also before, but um, it's, it's the fastest way actually without any mistakes to run like models. So using different parameters. Um, reproducible research is one of the main concepts of programming as well. So by creating some code, you can reproduce the research software if something happens and you can do it much faster than before. So, this is one of the most important for me, uh, which is uh, developing a structure and creating creative critical thinking. So programming is a completely different world. So it's a completely different way of thinking, different uh, way of uh, solving a problem. So before you start programming or you do something like, you always need to tackle the problem by just sitting down, take a piece of paper, maybe start um, thinking about how the structure of the program and the scripting is gonna work. So it, it lets you develop like a different way of thinking. So it's like learning a computer, like, a, like as a linguist aid and you can say more, but it's like a, a completely different language. So it's really like developing this skill is really important. And of course, improve career development because like nowadays, uh, knowing programming is a must actually like even outside academia, actually more outside academia than academia. Use cases. So um, you can find programming in any aspect of research and like from social uh, sciences to hard sciences and engineering, linguistics, business, marketing, whatever you like your topic is like you can um, apply programming and make your life easier. Here are a few cases um, like you can do um, a lot of programming and all behind all these things uh, there is programming. So like, for example, like I was doing molecular dynamic simulations for interactions between proteins and receptors to see how um, the uh, interactions are working uh, outside the cell and activate different pathways. So there are other ways like you can 3D model uh, different parts of the human body, like a lot of genomics, um, like electromagnetic simulations or like 
geophysics and things like that. So there are many, many, many cases where you can use actually like programming. All right, so now we'll, um, uh, we'll start talking about each language in turn. So we'll start with Python. Um, I don't know why this, this arbitrary order might have gone in chronological order, but we didn't. And this was the order that sort of stuck with this uh, webinar. So starting with Python, um, it was created in 1991 by uh, Guido van Rossum, um, inspired by languages like C, uh, may not mean anything to people, uh, Modular C and ABC. Um, you might have suspected, but it gets his name from Monty Python. Um, and the point of Python in the first place was to, uh, was, well, up, up until um, like early on in computing, programming languages were very, what, what are referred to as low level, um, uh, which makes them slightly less readable and it's more machine code. Um, Python was one of the, the, the uh, was, and it was in the C family of, of what are called higher order languages. Um, where the code is much more readable, readable and um, easy to uh, easy to write, essentially. Um, and Python has uh, Python's huge, so it, it has about one hundred and thirty thousand packages. Um, and uh, I should point out here that it's used much more widely than than research. In fact, it wasn't developed within research at all, um, but people soon uh, quickly decided that it could be used for research. Um, uh, but it's used much more widely. So people do things like build websites using, using Python and, and, um, uh, and a whole bunch of other use cases, games and so forth. It's worth mentioning here that uh, it's misleading the logo as well, like in the name, because like always like you think like you see the logo and you think that these are two snakes, but it's nothing to do the, with the snakes at, at the end. Actually, it's because like uh, the, all of the actually like the creator was really into Monty Python's Flying circus. So, yeah. True, but they've used the snake metaphor quite a lot. So, well, not they, but other people. So, uh, one of the um, IDEs that, that you can get for Python is called PyCharm, which sort of takes the, the, the metaphor of charming the snake, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and others that I'm probably not really thinking about. All right. Um, so, the advantages of Python um, include, these are not the only advantages, but um, it is open source. So uh, the code is free and uh, you don't have to pay for a license. The syntax is uh, pretty easy to understand. It's quite easy to code. And in particular, it's easy to debug. So the um, errors that Python gives you back uh, are quite uh, meaningful, um, which uh, is not, much, not so much the case in some of the other languages we'll talk about today. Um, as I mentioned, it's a general purpose language. So it's really intended to do a, a wide variety of things. It, it, it wasn't intended to uh, be specifically for research or anything. Um, there's a vast collection of libraries that, that are ready for use. Uh, some of them packaged already with the Python installation files that when you install, it comes with a lot of these packages, but the other ones are very simple to, to install. We won't talk about how to do things like that. Uh, that's more, more for a sort of introductory course, but um, uh, suffice to say that there's, there's tons of packages to do a huge variety of things. Typical use cases are within a research context, data analysis, data visualization, and uh, lots of data science applications as well. And its community is, um, is broader than research. So lots of developers, uh, lots of general purpose programmers, um, as well as researchers. The, uh, the drawbacks of Python, um, include that its installation, it can be uh, messy. Um, uh, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there was a version change a few years ago from two to three and um, the, and a lot of computers still ship with two. So people have to install the, the third version or version three. Um, and that has caused some backwards compatibility issues um, and also environment issues when you get, uh, uh, when you get these different versions um, building up. So that's one drawback. Um, they're kind of all three points there, but they kind of refer to the same, the same drawback. It can be a messy environment, essentially. Anything else to add to that, Anastasia? No, no, no. I mean, like, that's the most complex thing actually with Python, but as long as you install it, then like, I don't think there are any drawbacks other than that. Good. Right? 
Okay, so here are a few libraries. Uh, we think that are really popular in academia and really useful libraries. So um, we like deal um, in our everyday with uh, a few of them actually. So, and we teach a few of them. So NumPy and Pandas are really popular uh, for like NumPy is for scientific computing and arrays and then Pandas for data manipulation and uh, data transformation and things like that. Then a lot of libraries um, like Scikit-learn and Theano and Keras and TensorFlow, like really popular machine learning and deep learning uh, uh, libraries. And uh, it, it may, like it's worth mentioning here also that it may cause a bit of confusion because we will call them like libraries here and in other programming languages they call them packages or things like that, but it means the same thing. So there is the SciPy or there are the Matplotlib and Seaborn for visualization that we all uh, also teach. And then the NLTK, which is the most popular natural language processing and analysis um, library. Uh, I think it's also the, uh, Aiden worth mentioning that even though Python is quite old, it didn't become popular until 2005 or something like that when a lot of developers um, started working with uh, Python and then creating a bigger and bigger community. And then in academia, I think it became popular after 2012, 13. And now like it's the most popular after 20 years or like 30 actually years after the initial uh, release and something similar with R as well. Yep, incidentally, oh, onto R. Uh, so R was developed in 1993. So in the same uh, era really as, um, as Python. Um, something I didn't say that 19, the, the early 90s was, was really a, a, a pivotal moment for, for computing generally. Uh, in 1991, um, Linux was announced, uh, Python came out and also Vim, which is uh, my favorite text editor, was, um, was released. And these, you know, Linux is now like the uh, hands down the most widely used operating system um, in terms of, you know, servers and, and, uh, and other things and embedded systems and so forth. Um, uh, Python being one of the most widely used languages and Vim being one of the most widely used uh, text editors. So this was a very uh, turbulent and, you know, uh, yeah, very big era for computing. But in 1993, um, these, uh, these guys, Ross Ihaka and Robert Gentleman from the University of Auckland in New Zealand developed R. Um, it was based on a, another language called S. Um, S was not open source and they wanted to do an open source implementation um, of it. And uh, so the title, the name R is based on, um, based on both the fact that the language that it came from is called S. And uh, so they, they wanted another similar letter and their names both started with R. So that's why they went for R. Much to the chagrin of people like us who have an R-less accent because it makes talking about R quite difficult. Um, it also makes it quite hard to Google, um, which is quite irritating, which I'm sure a lot of people have discovered. Um, so, con so contrary to, to Python, which was really built as an all-purpose uh, programming language, R was designed in a university for doing statistical computing um, and graphics for uh, publications. Um, and that's kind of obvious when you, when, uh, when you look at the packages in, uh, in R that it really was designed with data science um, in mind. Or with statistical, uh, data science wasn't a thing back then, but statistical computing in mind. Um, in terms of number of packages, it, it also got a lot of packages, not quite as many as Python, um, probably, you know, a, a little over a tenth of the, of the number of packages, but um, the uh, packages in R are also, those 16,000 are very good. Um, so don't let the, the, the slightly lower number scare you off. Um, and there's some really, there's some really fantastic packages in there, which Anastasios will talk about, but um, I've worked with a couple of uh, interesting ones. For example, some, uh, someone's written a, um, a Twitter API uh, wrapper for, for R, which means you can, you can use R to um, automatically harvest tweets straight out of Twitter. It's called Twitter. Um, and by the way, all these packages uh, in R, they're, uh, they're all pu uh, curated and published by a um, network called CRAN, which I think, I can't remember what it stands for. I looked it up the other day, but it's a network of, of people publishing their, um, their packages for R, uh, along with documentation and so forth. Um, and so that's, when, that's where these 16,000 packages are stored. So its advantages, um, it is also open source. 
Um, it's oriented towards statistical analysis and data processing. So it's built in uh, number, you know, numerical math mathematics and arithmetic systems are very good. Um, uh, that actually is probably another drawback of Python is it can do the numeric uh, 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 evaluation, but you've got to be careful of some things in Python that, um, that we find in the introductory courses. Uh, sometimes it's a bit of a rounding issue with, with floating point numbers and so forth, but we won't talk about things like that. Um, as I mentioned, it's got a large collection of uh, packages. It's very good for visualization. So uh, both the built-in uh, data visualization and um, some of the packages like ggplot, which we'll talk about, are um, extremely good for visualization for publication ready plots, basically, and charts and tables. Um, in R, the, uh, there's, they make use of what's called vectorized operations, and these are highly efficient in R. Um, uh, contrary to some other things in R, which are maybe not so efficient. And the community is around lots of researchers, data scientists, statisticians, and, and data analysts. But it doesn't have much of a, um, it's not used widely outside of academia. It's used maybe a little bit, but um, but it really, it's its primary use case, or its primary market is within, uh, within research and academia. Some drawbacks, uh, the syntax is not particularly, it's also, it's also pretty straightforward, but it's not the, the easiest syntax for beginners. Um, probably more important is that the debugging information um, is not very clear in, in R as it is in Python. Uh, it's got a steep learning curve at the start and uh, for some things like loops and handling big data, R can be quite slow and memory intensive. So regarding also the debugging information, since you mentioned Aiden, um, like different programming languages so offer different debugging, debugging uh, and the algorithms behind are completely different. For example, Python has a really, really, like one of the best actually debugger, um, like the traceback is amazing and it gives you exactly like what is happening and when there is an error, it's gonna tell you where it is and go into the deepest level. Whereas R doesn't like errors, likes warnings. So it's gonna run everything and it's gonna give you just an empty result because like um, it didn't know what to do. So like there are differences so that's why we say also like this deep learning curve because in the beginning it takes a bit of time also to learn about these warnings and how to handle them whereas in python it's much easier because it's really a direct error you cannot run it until you solve this uh, also um our matlab and uh julia uh, were developed actually in universities and for different reasons but like mainly from academics whereas python was the only one developed like for generic purpose, actually. Even Julia is also for generic purpose. It was developed actually in MIT, so again, in the university. Okay, let's see a few packages. Um, one of the most popular packages uh, in R is the Tidyverse, which is a set of packages and includes um, dplyr and tidyr, for example, for data manipulation. And for me, one of the best packages in general, like in all programming languages for visualization is ggplot2. So it is fantastic. You can um, uh, create really publication quality uh, graphs. Zoo is another one for time series. And there are a lot actually for machine learning and deep learning like Carrot, Random Forest and goes on and goes on. So like even though like I said and mentioned like 16,000 may not look that big as uh, Python, Remember always that Python is also a generic programming language. So a lot of the packages are for completely different reasons that you may not even need in uh, uh, academia. So I'm pretty sure that for whatever you need, there is gonna be for sure a package ready for your needs. Okay, MATLAB. Um, so MATLAB is the oldest language we'll talk about today. It was originally uh, developed in 1970s um, by Cleve Moller. Uh, as a, a, an implementation of a few Fortran packages, so Fortran is a is an is a language that goes back um, a long way, back to the, back to the fifties, um, I think, even possibly the forties. Um, I'm not, no, well, fifties. Um, and uh, but Fortran is a, is one of these lower order languages that's that's a that's extremely difficult for novices to to work with. So Cleve Moller wanted to make um, some of the linear algebra. Um, and uh, other numerical packages available for uh, his students uh, to to use, and uh, so he he he. It's not really a wrapper, but he, but he sort of rewrote the, those as a as another. He rewrote those libraries as another language, which he called MATLAB. 
Um, then a few years later, um, he rewrote it in C um, in 1984. And so that was released as MATLAB. And it was released by a, um, an organization called MathWorks, which still exists. And it is the, um, the, the developer and owner and distributor of the software. Um, so it's des it was designed mainly for engineers, mathematicians, and scientists. And it's widely used in, uh, uh, in government business and in universities. It's got to, so where Python calls things libraries and um, R calls them packages. Um, that's right, isn't it? I've got it in the right order. Um, MATLAB calls them, uh, calls them tools, but they're the same thing. They're, they're about 35,000 tools um, in MATLAB and uh, apparently 3 million users, which is actually calculable because they, they know how many licenses there are out there. Whereas for R and, and Python, it's hard to know because there's, there might be many, many millions of people using it, using it but no way of tracking them. Um, so it's not open source, but um, most universities have um, site licenses. So if you, if you look around, find for your university whether there's a license, uh, you should be able to get access to it. And I think during coronavirus, they extended, the, uh, extended what you can do with the standard license that you get through the university, I think. I do, you recall, do you recall that? No, I don't. Oh, okay. I could be wrong. So the advantages of MATLAB is um, include its ease of use. Uh, there are there are built-in or downloadable apps which are basically point and click or click and drag um, building blocks that reduce the need to write code, uh, which is a very nice feature for beginners. Uh, there is extensive documentation, so all of the apps, all of the functions, and everything are, are documented very well. Um, uh, graphics, modeling, and simulations are optimized for efficiency. So it's very good at these things. Um, and also vectorized operations are highly efficient, just like they are in R. Uh, and there's a continual upgrade cycle of two releases per year. So there's always new um, features coming out with, with MATLAB. Uh, here's a view of some of the, some of the, the apps. We won't really talk about these, but um, you can, you can um, there's, there's apps in a whole bunch of different disciplines that you can um, download and uh, uh, plug into your workflows. There are some drawbacks of MATLAB, of course. Um, the most important being that it's not open source um, and licenses are quite, expen uh, quite extent uh, expensive. Um, and so really people only get access to it where they've got a license, for example, in a university. If they leave the university and go into industry, there's a big chance that the, the company they work for won't have a MATLAB license and won't pay for one. Um, also, the continual upgrade cycle can sometimes mean there's some compatibility issues. Uh, and so keeping your code up to date across those, uh, those upgrades uh, can be slightly challenging. Um, also, the user community and support is largely limited or contained within the, the MATLAB um, environment. So what's called MATLAB Central and File Exchange, um, which is itself quite useful. But uh, the community in, in other places like GitHub or Stack Exchange um, is not quite as as broad. So where people, you know, in R and Python get a lot of assistance from their peers on on places like Stack Exchange, that's not really a thing with MATLAB. Although the help that you can get, I believe, from MATLAB Central is um, is is quite good help, and help not just from peers who also use MATLAB, but also from the MATLAB developers and people who work at MathWorks. Okay, um, anything else to add about MATLAB before we move on to Julia? No, just to say also that um, the cycle means that there are two uh, versions every year, so version A and B, uh, and they released every year. And like, of, of course, you're not going to see any changes like in one year. But for example, if you were using MATLAB in 2015, and now like there may, there may be a lot of uh, differences, but MATLAB has a nice debugger and it's going to recommend you actually what's the newest version, actually maybe a different name of the function or a different name of the command just to help you um, really like uh, move to the new um, version. So, yeah. All right. So on to Julia. Um, Julia is the most recent of the languages that we will discuss. Uh, it was developed in 2012 at MIT by, uh, by, those creators. Um, there's also a commercial version available. So uh, at juliacomputing.com that allows you, if you want to, or universities to pay for a support package. Um, it's, uh, it's got a, it's only small so far, but there is a growing list of at the moment, 3000 packages. Um, and I think that's, that's been updated since we've last taught this course. So 
um, but these the packages for Julia are being generated are being created um, all the time and as as it grows in popularity which we'll show later is it is it's showing signs of, of, of uh, climbing up the scales in terms of popularity on uh, uh, by various metrics so that 3,000 packages will surely extend um, as it becomes more widely used so um, its advantages are that it is open source um, it is very efficient for lots of different styles of coding. So where Python has some efficiencies and some inefficiencies and R and MATLAB both have their uh, efficiencies, uh, Julia is efficient in, in quite a, a range of different styles of coding. And as I just can talk, about, talk, talk more about that if he wants to. Yeah, like just to mention here, like what this means, it, like a lot of programming languages tell you like, of course, like not in the beginning, but when you go to the part of uh, the next problem, which is the optimization, they tell you like, oh, don't use loops or try to take advantage of, um, of vectorization, for example, in MATLAB or other programming languages because it looks maybe slower or like, you know, like these kind of things. So in Julia, you don't have this big problem because a lot of the different styles actually like are really fast. And in one of the courses, uh, one of our trainers, Malcolm, actually like worth mentioning that he's writing a function actually like trying to convert the speed of a function that I write alone like to calculate let's say the exponentiation and it's faster than the built-in function which is actually amazing so um, I've actually found that myself so I've, I've written I've written stuff in R for, for um, people at ACU and then I talk to people like Anastasios or Malcolm and I say okay great now I want to extend this to you know to run a bit better and they say oh well you've written it wrong you should you should change it in the first place to, to use vectorized functions instead of loops um, which which can be quite irritating as a as a as a novice. Um, Anastasios, I'll let you talk to, about this rest of the slide because Julia is really your. Um... Yeah, sure. Um, so optimization is less complex. Is it means also that parallelization is less complex and also like it it can be customized. So a lot of programming languages now, since we use a lot of high performance computing, these big supercomputers because like sometimes it's impossible to run uh, big problems uh, and run them in local computers. So um, parallelization, so to run uh, code in three different CPUs, like it's much easier in Julia and it can be customized. Um, of course, like ability to call different programming languages, uh, scripts, for example, you can run Python code and R code and C and Java um, in Julia. You can do also like things like that in other programming languages, of course. Uh, it has a highly readable syntax, so we're going to see later on when we see the code and it, it actually added a few nice things from different programming languages to combine them together. So it takes like the human based indexing and it has like the closed index uh, compared to other programming languages. So it has a lot of uh, other simplicities like the multiple dispatch. I'm not going to confuse people with that, but it's, it's nice to, to have it here because uh, it, it oversimplifies a lot of uh, complicated things in programming. And uh, as we're going to say after here, uh, it's worth mentioning that Julia actually was created initially to solve the two programming language problem. And what is this one? This is actually because a lot of programmers when they try to do something, they're gonna perform something in one programming language because let's say Python is quite fast. So I'm gonna do all my analysis in Python, but then I would like to visualize my things in R. So, you know, like there are a lot of people like using two or three programming languages just to make things faster or nicer or like combine them. So the idea behind Julia was actually like, what if we want the speed of C, which is one of the fastest programming languages, and then also like the dynam dynamism and also like different functionality from different languages. So, and we have here like some, like we mentioned uh, in this one, which was actually like from uh, a talk of the creator, one of the creators. And he was mentioning that, you know, like he would like the a language that is usable for general programming as Python, but also easy for statistics for SR and as powerful for linear algebra as MATLAB. So it tries to combine all these elements. Uh, drawbacks. So steep learning curve for beginners as well. And my biggest drawback is actually that it's relatively new, which is not always a drawback, but it means that it's not that mature in terms of uh, packages or in terms of different functionality, but still it's worth uh, testing it. Um, 
Also, it's not a programming language that I would recommend for an absolute beginner. So Julia is really good when you start knowing a programming language and then you want to develop your skills or learn something new. So I would really recommend it as a second or third option. But it's a really, really powerful programming language and really easy to, to use. But yeah, the steep, there is a steep learning curve. Uh, of course, like since it's so new, there are not so many available libraries. But for all the academic things that we usually do, uh, there are available libraries. So for machine learning, statistical analysis, arrays, matrices, and all this stuff, like you can find or uh, text processing and analysis, or tweets and harvesting, web harvesting. There are packages for all these things. When we're saying like not so many, it means like not so wide for so many different specialized things. Debugging is a bit challenging. Yeah, yeah. But nowadays it's getting much better, uh, especially like when you need to install packages, like there were a few problems with the environment, but it, like it's getting much better. And in the newer versions actually like it's, um, it's, it's getting really good. And attention to language types is needed because uh, it's the best for performance. Uh, this means that, um, actually I'm not gonna go into this detail because it's gonna be confusing, but yeah, you need, you need to be careful with different elements actually when you use uh, Julia because it can be challenging uh, with different things that we use. And as I mentioned before, it's really like best for experienced programmers because um, uh, it's, it's not an easy one for really beginners. Like I would recommend other programming languages for beginners, but it's, it's growing a lot. And I hope in the future where we will see uh, Julia being one of the best ones as well for, for beginners. Okay, so now I'm gonna just try to show you um, the code examples from the different programming languages. So this is just to illustrate a bit the syntax and see a bit the differences between the programming languages. So in the first example, we're using also Cloud Store Swan uh, that we also use in our uh, training. It's worth mentioning about this uh, provided by Rnet. Uh, it's a cloud-based environment where uh, you can connect uh, by using your uni account and you have access to storage and also um, these um, compute, the cloud compute. Um, so it has a lot of uh, options to run Python or R, C++ and as well Octave is like a, a open source alternative of MATLAB. So here in Python, like um, you can see that the way we import things like import libraries as they called in Python is by using keywords and it's import. And then like you can import a CSV file and you can just plot something and that's how it looks. One of the big challenges in Python is that they don't end the, um, the syntax. For example, like here is a definition for a function. So you can see that we finalize the function with a colon, but then there is not a, an actual ending of this, but instead there is this indentation. That means that everything is inside here. You're gonna see in other programming languages, we, it's more clear and this can be a confusion. Another um, difference between um, Python and all the other three programming languages is the zero indexing, which is the computer-based indexing. So when you start counting in uh, Python, you always start counting from zero. So that's also like a bit of a challenge for beginners because like humans, uh, start, you know, like um, counting from one. So it can be a challenge. So here is, for example, a for loops to do something repetitive. So we have a list of two, let's say, CSV files and we would like to perform an analysis. So we can do that using a loop. Again, you can mention that everything is closing by the column and then there is not an end or a bracket in order to finalize this index. So it's always this indexing, which is also like a bit um, hard for beginners, but at the same time, like it's really easy to read because like it's more obvious with the spaces and all this stuff. So it has the readability, but it can be also challenging. And that's an example of uh, Python. So I'll go to R after. So I have our studio here where um, this is the syntax for uh, the same exactly thing in R. So we read a CSV file using a function called read.csv. This is actually like just to plot one of the files. So if I would like to calculate something and then plot 
this graph, which is the average inflammation of a data set per day. And then this is a function. So one of the big differences is the left arrow, which is the equal sign, the assignment symbol in R, which is actually something that only in R is used. And one of the other differences is the curly brackets here. Like you can see that when I write a function, for example, or uh, something, I initialize and closing the syntax by using the curly brackets. So everything inside here is included in this function. And the same for the loop. So you can see here, this is a loop. I define whatever I want and then it's closed in these curly brackets. And this is doing exactly the same. So I have two graphs actually like plotting the average inflammation per day. And this is in R. So main differences usually are like the assignment symbol, which is like one of the, actually maybe the only one that uses the left arrow. Like you can also use equal sign, but I'm not gonna talk about that. But the, uh, the creators always uh, recommend people to use these left arrows for assignment and this closing syntax, which makes it easier. But as you can see for readability is a bit more challenging. And I'll continue with um, Julia. So, um, no, MATLAB first. Sorry, this is MATLAB online. So it's the cloud-based uh, version of MATLAB. So if you have a uni account, you can always register and create an account in MathWorks and automatically it's gonna check if it's a uni account that has a license and it's gonna give you access to MATLAB online to use it uh, in the cloud version. So in MATLAB, we have completely different syntax. So if I would like to create functions, so I need to create different files that they're called M files because from MATLAB and then each function should be a different file and they have the same name as the file here. So here is actually like the function actually importing in a CSV file, calculating the average inflammation per day and then plotting it. And then in my actual script, I need to create another one where I say like close everything and then import to uh, create a list of two CSV files and then run a loop. So you can see here that also the four is ending by the keyword end. So you can see here that this is an indication that this is part of one uh, syntax. So this is a loop. So we're running something multiple times. So we're running the analysis. We call this function two times because I have two items. So you can see a bit of a difference here because we need to use different files in order to define functions in MATLAB. And also instead of curly brackets or indentation here, we use the end in order to end things and the same here in the function. And the last thing is Julia. So Julia is using uh, different ways of importing. So in Python, we saw the import here. We um, have a different one for importing packages, which is the using. And here is the uh, syntax of a function. So you see that there are similarities, similarities with um, MATLAB. So I end the syntax using the end and I use the keyword function. So I don't use any curly brackets, but I just close the syntax by using the end. And so this is the function actually to do exactly the same, analyzing inflammation data sets and calculate the average inflammation per day and then plotting it. And this is a loop. So for is the same keyword in all the programming languages. And then I finalize my syntax using the end. So you can see a lot of similarities and um, different, also like a few differences in different programming languages. Uh, it's um, worth mentioning also that in the basic level, like when we're talking about functions, variables, loops, and conditionals, all programming languages have the same concepts. So they use the same concepts and actually like all programming languages, like C, Java, and everything, like actually use these programming concepts. So all of them sharing the same things, but the syntax can be a bit different and it's always good. And we're gonna talk about that. Aidan is gonna talk later about that. It's always good to try and see different programming languages before you start going and specializing into one. I might just add that um, uh, the, you you know, we mentioned that in Python, that's the indentation that, that's syntactic there. So um, having a, you know, four, item in, in list colon and then new line must be indented and it waits until the indentation stops and goes back to the sort of left edge to to know when you're out of the um, out of that out of that block um, 
but you'll notice that all of the other uh, code that sh that, that uh, Anastasios showed was also um, uh, indented. Um, but in, in Python, it's actually syntactic. In the other languages, it's used as a convention just for to aid the readability, but it doesn't actually make a difference to the execution of the code in those other languages. Um, just one thing to, that people might get tripped up about. All right, um, so let's move on to um, the popularity. I think we're, it's about 120, so we might just have to speed up a little bit so that people can return to their day. Um, but here are, here are a couple of metrics that uh, we've, we've found online. Um, I'm just may want to talk about these a little bit more. Um, uh, and, but you'll see that uh, Python, is, Python R and MATLAB are in that order, um, the more popular languages, and then Julia um, as an as a often distant fourth, but that kind of reflects its recency and probably reflects you know, Python, Python and R being around for a lot longer. Uh, MATLAB maybe not being open source, hasn't climbed up as quickly as some of these languages like Python and R. Um, do you want to add anything? Extra? Um, um, you can see here, um, for example, like I'm going to use the pointer, just to show like a bit the climb in Julia. So you can see that there are three um, green arrows, meaning that it's going super fast up, which means that a lot of people are using it nowadays. And all S for MATLAB, I mean, um, MATLAB is always uh, like a licensed software. So it means that a lot of companies outside engineering companies or different businesses using it. That's why like, it's always like around like 20 to 15 and it's quite popular for this. And that's why they use it a lot in engineering because it's mainly like for simulations, modeling and all this stuff. It has a really powerful like visualization in simulation um, part in it. Also, I'm going to jump quickly to Stack Overflow, which is one of the like, um, most uh, popular websites for programming and where, where you can ask the community and find uh, question, uh, answers to questions. And they did a survey this year, actually, and they do it every year for the most popular uh, programming languages for developing, for devel developers, sorry. And in terms of the loved one, like you can see that Python is on top, like it's the third one. But also, Julia, you see that it's really popular actually now among uh, developers. So they really like it. They like the functionality. They like how fast it is. And R is a bit lower. Uh, MATLAB is not part of this one because like it's not open source, I think. So, and it's not included uh, sometimes. And also like for people who don't use a programming language and they would love to learn, uh, Python is on top. So people who doesn't need, who don't use it at the moment, they would love to learn actually like Python. And then you can see R and Julia are, R is here, and then Julia is all the way down. Okay, job opportunities. Uh, actually, it's worth showing the other thing as well. So sorry for jumping in all the time, but it's worth showing you a few things. Uh, it's really like, as you probably understand after all these um, discussions that Python is by far the most popular in job vacancies as well. And because it's a generic programming language, so it means that it's easier to find jobs, not only um, like as a analyst, but also as a developer, software developer, or like web, developer and goes on and goes on. And then we have R after, and then MATLAB is a bit down, and then Julia is actually on page three. So because it's really new, like not many people, and if they ask for Julia, they're gonna ask for another programming language as well. So it's, if you try to find a job you, with Julia, it's gonna be also like with like, we want Julia or Python or something else. So it's not just one programming language. It's because it's not matured yet, and it's a new programming language, so it's always recommended as a second or uh, second option. Also here, it's about salaries, like in Stack Overflow, the same survey. So Julia and Python are pretty similar. This is US dollars and it's about developers who have full-time jobs in uh, US. And Julia and Python are quite here with um, job, um, the, the salaries, and then R is just a bit low, but it's the same. We're gonna talk also about what we found um, um, based on our experience and our discovery later on. So here, Aiden. Yeah, so this is, um, this is 
just impressionistic. We've got, you know, these metrics aren't based on any, uh, any science, uh, quite honestly, just, just us going through these features and giving a star rating. Um, so performance, uh, we think Julia is, is really very, very highly performant um, and, and followed by Python and then R and MATLAB. Uh, still very good, three stars out of five, um, but they, they do run a bit slower in some aspects. But really, for, for most people's use cases, performance wouldn't be an issue unless you start talking about parallel things and high-performance computing and so forth. That's when you want to start uh, trying to, to take advantage of, of uh, performance. Or big data sets, right? Yeah. And big data, exactly. Um, when it comes to the ease of use, um, uh, Python and MATLAB are, are really easier than the others. Julia gets three stars and R is just a little bit lower on, on two stars. Just a bit of a steeper learning curve, I think, with R than the others. Um, and some things that can trip you up, which I know from personal experience. Um, data analytics, um, uh, Python and R win on this. Uh, I'm not sure why Julia doesn't have five stars there. Maybe you could explain that. Yeah, I mean, like it's still like trying to develop things. So you may find some challenges. Um, we didn't give five because like Python and R are so, they have so many rich libraries and you can do everything. Of course you can do it in Julia, but just because it's new, like we wanted to just give um, credit to Python and R because it's the safe way, right? So, yeah, but there is a potential for MATLAB and Julia actually to be used as well, like with five stars. Mm. When it comes to support, um, the reason we're giving these all one star is um, sort of unfair. It, we mean in support, we mean, uh, uh, we mean support from the developers, right? So MATLAB is a, uh, is a paid application, so you get when you have a license, you get support from MathWorks. Um, there's no support. There's no official support for Python R or Julia, although you can pay for support with JuliaComputing.com. Um, conversely, in the community, that that the community column really refers to the sort of community support that you can get from places like uh, Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, GitHub, and so forth. And for that, Python and R are the absolute winners. Uh, it's they're used f far and wide by people who you know very likely had the same kind of uh, questions that, that that you might have uh julia is still new to to the world so uh, the 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 community is not so large and therefore the community support isn't so isn't so great but um it's but it's definitely growing when it comes to libraries and tools all of them score five out of five julia less so because it's still so new but those uh those libraries are becoming more um prevalent as time goes on and finally, on the job market, uh, Python probably wins here because mainly because it's used outside academia as well and used more more widely. Um, uh, R is still very uh, uh, highly um, desired in uh, in developers and data scientists, um, and those those two are the winners there, I think. And again, Julia, we've given a couple of empty stars because things might change as as Julia becomes more popular, which we we reckon it probably will. Okay, some general guidelines, as we said, like as Aidan said, actually in the beginning, like we are not gonna tell you which one is the winner, but we're happy to share our knowledge and give you some uh, general guidelines about how to choose. So the first part of this one is to ask your supervisor and peers and do your own research. So it's really important for you to check which are languages most commonly used in your field, because the most important, if it's really commonly used in your field, it means that there may be a lot of available packages for that. And there is maybe code available for use. And that's part of the community, right? Like um, Python and R have so many people, it's open source. Everybody shares code uh, freely and openly. So it means that you can find a lot of code like for reuse. So one of the, the first steps is actually to see for example, if you do astrophysics, you can check actually like for whatever you do, like uh, check the packages that exist for different analysis and check if there is code for you to reuse. You might want to even look a bit closer to home and find out if your supervisor or your colleagues um, or your you know, lab mates are using uh, any particular languages because uh, they, will, they will be a great source of uh, peer support um, if, you, if you start learning a language, um, you know. Don't reinvent the wheel and pick up a, 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 a language that no one, no one in your community is using. That's a good point. So then the second point here is um, why should I use uh, programming and what problems I'm trying to solve? So is it small scale or big scale data analysis? Is it software building in general or 
something specific or is it like, am I gonna do like some website integration? So different programming languages have different um, pros and cons. So, and they're faster in different uh, aspects. So by checking actually the, the problems that you would like to solve, you can actually uh, shortlist the programming languages that offer best functionality and performance. And the last point is about existing libraries that you can take advantage of. As I mentioned in the first point, um, different programming languages offer really rich libraries in different topics. Of course, Python has rich libraries in almost everything and R as well, but uh, MATLAB is, as I mentioned, really good in simulations and modeling and Julia is getting better and it's, its performance is amazing. So depends on what you're trying to do. For example, if it's me and I want to do data visualization, the first thing I'm gonna think is actually ggplot. So because I really like this library, but then if it's about text processing, I may go to Python because I know that then of is much better is really mature library. So I can take advantage of it. But uh, for example, if you do machine learning, you can use any of the programming languages because all of them have rich libraries for that. So these are a, a few guidelines in order to um, shortlist at least the programming languages that you would like to use. So um, we're getting to the final couple of slides now. Um, one thing to point out is, we've said this continually, but at the basic level, these languages are all really fundamentally the same. So if you're just starting out learning programming, um, it really doesn't matter which one of these um, you use, you might find that really what you're learning is uh, the concepts of programming rather than a specific language. Um, and the first one is going to be most difficult. So maybe pick one that's got the, the you know, really scores highly on the kind of ease of use. Um, and, you know, Python, I think is, uh, is probably the easiest to use than uh, a Python or MATLAB. Um, and then every new language, and I'd suggest you learn more languages, but uh, each new language you learn becomes easier after the first one. Um, and you might find uh, uh, it'll be a good idea to try try out a few before specializing in in any particular language to see which one kind of might meld better with you personally. Uh, another point to mention is that there are more job opportunities and and higher salaries for people who can combine you know more than one programming language. So I've seen stats in the past that the you know the salaries for for R programmers and the salaries for Python programmers. Um, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a multiplier in the, the, the salaries for people who can code in both R and Python or R and SQL or Python and SQL. So we haven't talked about SQL, but um, it's a different kind of language um, uh, is is advantageous then to, to learn a couple of them. Just one uh, thing on the uh, try a few before specializing. We mentioned that they're like fundamentally the same, uh, but at the same time, like when you go deeper into a programming language, they are completely different. So for example, Python is an object oriented programming language, which means completely different from R. So if you go really deep into a programming language, you're gonna find a lot of differences. So in that top level, they are the same, but then as you go deeper, like they start specializing and using their performance for different features they, they utilize. So that's why we're saying try a few before specializing. Yeah, and there's a question there. Is it difficult to learn more than one language or program? Um, not in the first uh, stages. Only, it only becomes more uh, difficult when those lang when you do get more into depth and start learning things like how to optimize and so forth, which probably most people won't be doing, you know, in the first in the first while of learning languages. Okay, so uh, where to next? Um, well, you could look out for introductory training in programming languages. Um, there's lots of activity around this in universities and organizations like Intersect. Um, you could look at our website. We've, if you come from an Intersect member, you might be able to find a course that's happening at your local university uh, in any one of these languages. We happen to teach all four um, amongst a, a, a couple of others, but um, uh, you might also look out for Software Carpentry, which also teach um, these four um, languages, or um, I'm not sure if they teach Julia yet, but yeah. they certainly teach R, MATLAB, and Python. Um, there's, uh, we've demoed a couple of these today, or, or Anastasios did, but there's lots of online services where you can run some code online. It might not work so quickly as it would as a local installation on your on your computer, but it, they're, they're very good for just trying things out. So um, uh, colab.research.google.com is an online Python environment. And that uses Jupyter Notebooks in, in a kind of it, authenticated by your Google account. So if you've got one, you can, you can start writing Python code in there. Um, rstudio.cloud, and that's the URL, is, um, is a place where you can run uh, R 
uh, uh, programs and build them, build them yourself. Um, and that's the same interface as our studio that you would download and run locally. So that's a very good option. Uh, Anastasios demoed MATLAB online through MathWorks. Um, so if you just Google MATLAB online, you can probably sign in with your university credentials and get access to MATLAB. And Julia Box, um, unfortunately, they've just made this a paid feature. So it's no longer free. Um, but you, what you can do, however, is you can get the Julia kernel installed in something like Jupyter Notebooks. So uh, that is a free option. So you can, so if you if you download and install Anaconda for to get Python, um, you can also install the Julia kernel and run it locally. Finally, um, one a very useful thing to mention is Cloud Store's Swan service. Anastasios mentioned this when he was showing the Jupyter uh, when he was showing the Python code example. Um, uh, so this is this is free and available for researchers from Australian universities to or staff um, to log into and use. And they've got kernels for Python, R and Octave, which is an open source variant of, um, of MATLAB. Um, doesn't come with things like, you know, the tool the, at the, uh, the apps toolkits and so forth, all the support, but it's the same fundamental programming language or works fundamentally the same. Finally, uh, you can check out next month's webinar where Malcolm Ramsey uh, will be demoing in a bit more detail some data analysis workflows and pipelines in both Python and R using COVID-19 data. So uh, you can look at our website. We've got the uh, uh, discuss, dis we discussed the, the topics and uh, it's currently open so you can enroll um, in that if you want to. And that brings us to the end. So uh, on that note, we will uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I think we'll stay online for a little bit while if there's any questions that pop up, I think there's been one that I'm going to have to throw to Anastasios. Just before um, we finish, I and just to also mention because um, a lot of people may not be from our member universities, it's uh, good to mention that you can find these uh, introductory courses uh, for programming in other organizations and in your local institution. So please check your local institution and ask for it. So there are like QC for Queensland or Uni of Melbourne, Monash and other universities offering this internally. So like please check, please check your local institution because this is an open webinar. So um, you may not uh, from one of our member universities. And perhaps if they're not offering training in, in programming, then ask why not and demand that they do. Uh, that's, that's up to you. All right. Um, so thank you very much. And, uh, and we'll stay on the line for, uh, for a bit. There is a question already from Caitlin Williams, which I'm, I'm going to have to uh, throw to you because I don't know. Um, but Caitlin notices that Julia's code is similar to Swift's. Does it tend, uh, does it tend with more complex operations to keep that similarity? I don't know about Swift actually, like that's, that's something new that I, I listen, but, uh, the owners, the creators actually like, uh, took a lot of uh, elements from so many different programming languages just to make it, uh, to simplify the, the, the scripting and the use of, um, the programming language. So, Thanks for sharing, but um, I, I knew until now, like for a few programming languages that they took elements. It's heavily like taking elements from uh, MATLAB, like because it's easy to use and a lot from C and Mal um, uh, Python because of the performance. So that's the two that I know for sure, three actually. So there's another question. Uh by Shahid. For speed and high computation, how do you rank MATLAB with Python or R? Or which one, Gulam? Sorry. For speed and high computation, uh, computations, how do you rank MATLAB with Python or R? Um, I think MATLAB tends to slow down at some of the more complex computations. Um, if written well, R will scale very well. Um, if you take advantage of the vectorized functions. Yeah, I think that Python is for sure like really like performing really well and it's quite fast and it can handle big data. MATLAB and R are built in different like features that can be optimized. For example, uh, MATLAB uh, is based on matrices. So if you can have things vectorized and use matrices, it's gonna speed up a lot because I was using MATLAB for my research and like if you compare the way, like you can, you can have a code, similar code 
optimizing it a bit with um, matrices and multiplications and vectorization, it's going to speed up like really like a lot. So it can vary uh, depend, depend on the scripting style. So it can vary. But yeah. I think the safest one, probably Gulam, you can uh, comment on that, uh, is Python actually. Yes, so I think uh, the one major uh, drawback in that particular aspect of things for MATLAB is that it's huge. So yep. it uh, takes lots of memory to load itself. Yep. And then on top, it needs to load data and so on. So it could um, be a little, uh, you know, there could be a little disadvantage in that. Uh, uh, but yes. So, uh, and also, if you want to use like really big supercomputers, like Python and R, I think are more efficient. MATLAB is really good as well. It's getting better, but since it has this interface and it's it's it it's a bit harder. So it's easier to utilize Python and R in uh, high performance and supercomputers and all this stuff. Could installation be an issue with MATLAB and um, machines like Gaddy? No, 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 it's installed there, but um, it, it can be actually like, it's not parallelized so well probably like as the other programming languages. There's another question about uh, taking advantage of GPU. A couple of questions actually asking about GPU. Yep. Yeah, I think so, I, sorry, Gulam, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, you can write uh, code uh, to take advantage of GPUs in, in all of them, <laughs> but Python and MATLAB more easily than R, I would say, and in MATLAB, you can get lots of help from MathWorks in writing GPU enabled and optimized code. Uh, but again, the major uh, learning curve I have seen, which comes when people are writing code uh, to run on HPC in MATLAB is to move from GUI based or graphical user interface to the uh, shell or command line interface in MATLAB. Because you can do that, but people are not used to interacting with MATLAB in a uh, command line fashion. So that is the biggest learning curve I have seen. But yes, you can do that in both. Yeah, and it doesn't mean also like it's really important because I was doing at some point like CUDA, which is in like an amazing parallelization kind of software in C. And it's, um, it's not always the best option for parallelization, right? It doesn't mean that if you parallelize your code, it's gonna be so well and efficient that it's gonna give you a lot of boost in terms of speed. So yeah, it takes a bit of time uh, to learn how to parallelize correctly and without having to invest a lot of time to learn. Okay, so there was one more question which was related to vectorization. So that was, uh, if I can get to that and get the exact wording. So what is meant by use vectorized functions rather than loops? So vectorization is the technique to do element-wise operations. So instead of just running all over again, the same thing and doing things, like there are a lot of, uh, a lot of programming languages use this vectorization to provide like uh, operations per element or, you know, like this kind of thing. So a vector is a list of elements, so you can perform things by element, so that's 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 what we're trying to. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and just elaborate on that. So when you do vectorized operation, it's really and, and the languages support vectorized operation. For example, R and Python do that. It makes use of the processor ar architecture. So the mm -hmm. processor ar architecture is vectorized. That enables the operations to go or run in parallel, which makes it a bit faster than essentially running a loop which goes or processes one element after another. Yeah, that's a good point because like for each loop, it needs to stop, process it, and then go to the next one. Whereas like with vectorization, it can send every, because it's the same operation. So it can serve in each CPU actually like the operation and go faster. So that's why it can boost your code. But again, like it needs a bit of um, careful consideration when you, you do that. Another question just came in, which is, which did you learn first and what do you prefer now? For me, uh, I learned, well, for Gulam, it's Python on both, on both accounts, I think. Um, yeah. For me, I, uh, uh, the first programming language proper that I started learning was Python. Um, and, but before that, I was doing a lot of bash scripting. So I'd, I'd done some, you know, uh, real, you know, 
basic command line stuff to move files around and so forth. And then someone showed me how to do something in Python. Um, and, and so I started learning that. And now I've been learning a lot more R recently. Um, I, I like it. I'm preferring to use, uh, to use R, uh, but I'm running into some of these issues. Like I don't, I don't really know, uh, probably how to vectorize. So, um, it's, um, so that's causing me a bit of, a bit of strain. Unfortunately, I was like in physics, so I learned first Fortran and then C because uh, a lot of things uh, were written in Fortran by physicists. So I started with hardcore uh, programming languages until I find like really nice ones. So, yeah. Uh, Robin, just saw your question in the Q&A. Um, yeah. uh, so for data formatting and wrangling, would you tend to use R, Python or Visual Basic in Excel, for example? Um, I've often found recording and tweaking macros in, in Excel and Visual Basic faster than creating code from scratch. So for data formatting and wrangling, um, yeah, I, I, not sure. I, um, I probably, well, actually these days I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of data formatting in Vim, um, just with, you know, not, not so much, yeah, sort of with macros and search and replace and, and other, other little functions that I write in Vim script. Um, but um, I've previously used Python for doing a lot of that. I had to do a job, um, I had to do a very um, tedious task once where I had um, a, a table full of values and I had to turn those into, um, uh, for each row, I had to make a new Excel, I had to make an XML file that, um, that took a few of the columns and, and output them in a, in a particular uh, template for import into another program for metadata analysis and so forth. Um, and I, uh, someone showed me, this is when I first used Python. So someone showed me how to, how to write that up in Python. Um, and I found that to be very quick and simple. Um, I've never tried to really do that in R. Yeah, it's deploy R and all these tidy verse that we mentioned here, like you can do that, like, and you can use pandas, which are really popular packages actually in libraries in Python and R. So you can definitely do that, but you need to invest time, of course, to learn. So if you want something quite, quite fast and easy, I mean, like Excel is always like faster uh, to learn, but then the process, if you have to do it repetitive, like in a repetitive way and you need to do it again and again, then probably it's worth investing some time to learn how to do it in Python and R. But both programming languages are quite uh, all right with, like they have really like good libraries to do that. Pandas and Deploy are amazing. I use them almost um, every day for my work but also like depends on how big is the data set because maybe Python can handle big data like a bit better than R, especially Come when you're coding. Come on, say it guys, Python. I mean, <laughs> what are you waiting for? Yeah, okay, okay. We don't like to be drawn on a favorite. It's like, but Python. <laughs> but yeah, like it's, you need to invest a bit of time in programming to learn before you see the uh, efficiency. So. <laughs> it's a couple of stories there, uh, uh, Taylor. Um, yep, I know, what, I know what you mean. Um, yeah, for so many things like data wrangling, you've thought this would be easier if you could code. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was what I was going through, you know, six or seven years ago, and uh, I'm very glad that I that I, that I learned it, um, and now it's so much more widely useful now. Um, and Paul, thanks for the story. Heard I had a, heard a presentation of Python Meetup group um, of a guy who automated Excel reports in his job for a bank and saved from four to five days, um, and and went down from four to five days to one day and kept saying when asked he was still working on the report. Uh, it reminds me of Anastasios who had automated his PhD um, analysis and uh, would just be running uh, running jobs on high performance computing and his supervisor would say, this will take you a few weeks. And he's like, yep, sure, click, see you in a few weeks. Yeah, don't say it that loud though. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trim that from the recording. No, but that's true. That's true. Actually, like that's that's what I'm I'm saying. Actually, like it's worth investing time. You're not gonna see it in um, like a few months because you need to practice and learn how to use them. But then it's gonna make your life much easier because you can run all the analysis that takes long, like in the background, and then do something else. So. Okay, I think at that point we're um, considerably over time. So. Um... Uh, thanks for the discussion after the webinar and thank you for joining us to those of you who are still here. 
Um, the, this is being recorded and we'll put the recording up on the uh, Intersect website. So um, you can, you know, you can, you can still see it if you, if you missed it, although I'm telling you, those of you who are still here. Okay, at that point, we'll close the webinar. So um, thank you all for coming and we'll see you at the next one in a month's time. Thank you very Thanks. much.